with your kids. Hola, nihao, konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum, shalom, mahaba, moni muliwanji, namaste, jambo, bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee and this is the Reading With Your Kids podcast, an iHeartRadio Best Kids and Family Podcast Award nominee. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app, on Spotify, Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, wherever you find your podcasts. We are delighted that you're part of our mission to help families grow closer through reading. Our guest today is Vera Harris. She is here to celebrate MJ in the big kitchen window. Before we invite Vera into the studio, we want to let you know we have a brand new Reading With Your Kids certified great read. It's Mommy's Oven by Brandy Pierce. Are you struggling with how to talk to your kids about surrogacy and all the many different ways a family is created? Books are a great resource that can break it down for kids in a fun, respectful, and easy to understand way. Our latest certified great read, Mommy's Oven, is an acclaimed children's picture book that makes it easy to start a conversation with your child about the special way they came into the world or the special way in which their little brother or sister will be welcomed into the world. Mommy's Oven is written by Brandy Pierce and is beautifully illustrated. It introduces young children ages 2 to 8 years old to surrogacy. Follow the story of August and his family as he learns about the unique way his brother or sister will be born through the kindness of a surrogate. He learns that another woman named Julia will help his parents have a baby by growing the baby in her tummy, in her oven. Join him as he discovers that sometimes the sweetest and most delicious cakes are baked in someone else's oven. Augie's story helps it to explain why some families choose surrogates to help grow their families and why surrogates choose to help other families that way. This is a cute little book to help parents talk about the special way their child came into their lives. It's a complete portrayal of the surrogacy process from beginning to end with sensitivity and intelligence. This book illustrates that with open communication and honesty, even what seems like a difficult conversation with your child can turn out to be the most rewarding talk you might have with them. We highly recommend this book as a permanent part of your family's home library to be shared over and over and over throughout the years. Congratulations to Brandy Pierce. Mommy's Oven is our latest Reading With Your Kids certified great read. Joining us right now from Forney and Texas, right outside of Dallas. She's returning to the show. One of our favorite guests. Please welcome back Vera Harris. Vera, how are you? I am great. Thank you for having me again, Jedi. It's nice to be back again. How are you doing? I'm doing really well, and I'm really happy that you're doing well. Um, we, When we're recording this, Vera is just back into her home. Texas, the state of Texas, was hit with an incredibly unusual um, weather pattern where they experienced snow and freezing rain and, and all sorts of power outages and everything. And I'm just so thankful that you're back in your home and that you're safe. And uh, hopefully the rest of the state will be back in their homes and safe as well. Yes, that is, that's the prayer for all of us in Texas. We, uh, we, uh, pulled together and we helped each other neighbor and people looked after the senior citizens. And I'm glad to be back in my home because I was without power for almost three, three solid days. And I just with the, without the kindness of, uh, one of my neighbors, uh, I'm not quite sure if I would have made it, but thank God for them because they had, they knew some people that had, uh, power and they came and got me. And we uh, drove there slow and got to uh, their um, their relative house, and I was able to stay there for about six hours on last um, on last Wednesday. Mm-hmm. And when I did come back home, the power was on later there later that night. So uh, we're still uh, digging out, but we're 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 doing well. Well, that's one of the things I I, I wanted just to celebrate is the fact that. It was an incredibly difficult and challenging time, and everybody stepped up. 
and and helped each other and and I think that's a beautiful thing and I think it's especially important to kind of celebrate those moments because we're living in a period of time right now where we're not seeing a lot of unity and a lot of cooperation with people. We're not even seeing a lot of people being able to have conversations with each other um, uh, where people can disagree, respectfully disagree with one another. So it's good to know that in times of real crisis, we can come together and see the humanity and our, our, our shared humanity. Yes, that is so correct. And um, that's I'm really proud of to live in Texas in spite of everything we went through. I mean, with the snow, the ice, uh, no power, no heat. And some pe- some places had to uh, boil water. Uh, everybody just kind of stepped up. I mean, there were people that were literally making sandwiches and they and passing them out to people that didn't even have that did not have anything to eat. So I'm uh, really proud the way Texas pulled together yeah. during this crisis. And I'm really proud. Uh, Vera is a Reading With Your Kids certified great read author, and she's back celebrating a brand new book. It's called MJ in the Big Kitchen Window. Tell us all about this book, please. Yes, uh, MJ and the Big Kitchen Window is about a, a little dog that has a loud bark. And every day he would go to the kitchen window that's located in the kitchen, and he could look out onto the street. And when he looked out, you know, he would see, uh, you know, birds or he would see a rabbit, just see all type of animals. And he he really wanted to go out there and make friends with them. So um, that's what this story is about. Uh, he just wanted to go out and he make friends with them. And he would um, he would just um, just, you know, because he he figured that his friends were outside and not inside. So that barking uh, led me to um, in the book take him for a walk, and there he met all kinds of friends. Oh, that's so wonderful. You know, as you're talking um, about that, I, my my daughter was living up in Vermont uh, last year, and her um, dog, Calvin, uh, they were living on a farm, which was really unusual because Alejandra grew up in the big city here in Boston, and, and uh, she found herself living on a farm, and Calvin would look out the window and there were a couple of horses on the farm and he would always get excited looking out and seeing the horses out, out in the corral and, and, and he would love to go out with my daughter and uh, he wanted to play with the horses. Um, they, they were a little bit big and they weren't really crazy about playing with a little puppy. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, uh, yeah, we, we have a lot of horses. My brother, one of my brothers has horses, so it was challenging, uh, this past week and last week that he would, you know, go to his barn and make sure that the horses, uh, had water and had hay. And then him and a bunch of his friends, they just started taking care of everybody that was housed in that area. And they, cause some of the people couldn't make it there to take care of their horses. So they had a little chat going and he would go back and forth and, and say, Hey, uh, we'll be here from, from nine until six. So if you need your horses watered or if you need some hay, let me know. So about six of them pulled together and took care of the horses and all the horses did survive and they're doing great. That's beautiful. And you know, you are living through what your, your, your book MJ in the big kitchen window is all about. Just that, that desire that we have to be together and to, and to make friends with our neighbors. That is correct. I mean, in spite of this pandemic that's been going on, you know, going on for over a year, you know, a lot of time um, uh, myself, as well as I'm sure a lot of my neighbors find themselves just kind of looking out the big window, just mm. wondering, you know, is there still life out there? And uh, that is why I uh, chose to uh, write this book, because my little dog, her name is MJ short for Mary Jane. She actually would go to the window every day and just bark. And then that's when I knew some kids was walking on the sidewalk or that's when I knew a squirrel was climbing up a tree. Or that's when I knew uh, the neighbor would maybe be taking a walk or someone would be, you know, walking down the sidewalk or running or riding a bike. So her with her uh, letting me know with that bark and it gave me, um, you know, a realization that there's still a life out there. Boy, oh boy, you know, that that's right. Um you, you, my my beautiful wife and I were just sitting down talking about it. It's been we're we're closing in on a year, a year where we've basically been 
in our homes, locked down in our homes. Now, granted, we were able to go out and and go shopping, and I think we've gone out to dinner twice (laughs) in in a year, and it's it's hard to think about that. Uh, I'm I'm really excited that that your book is a great way for for families to kind of come and, and talk about that because. Now, you know, it's been a year out of my life, but I've lived almost a hundred years. So it's not that big a chunk out of my life. But for the kids who are going to be reading this book with their parents, the four, five, six year olds, even younger, this is a huge part of their life. You're five years old and you spent a year locked down in your house. That's 20 percent of your life. That's correct. Yeah. And um, I'm hoping that um, the parents and uh, uh, teachers and educators have they do get this book that they would read it to the kids because uh it, it um I wanted to let the kids know that they're not forgotten, you know, because they're are they are in the house and a lot of them are on uh social media on on Zoom and um you know to pick up a book and kind of visualize, you know, hey, uh, that people are still out there, that uh animals are still out there, that there's a still a world out there. Uh, I think would do the kids a world of good. And plus this is a good book that um just when the kids, uh, because it's written um, um, for smaller, uh, younger ages, I think it's a good book to um, to end a night. You know, before you go to bed, this would be a good storybook for the kids. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm guessing that this would be um, a, a wonderful way to get kids dreaming uh, about about their friends, about being able to, being able to get outside, and and also just having those really, really pleasant thoughts about friendship and about love as you're drifting off to sleep. That is true because um, in the story, the characters, some of the people that um, MJ barks at are, you know, birds, rabbits, squirrels. And so I was trying to project um, different people, Mm -hmm. you know, people look differently and may act a little differently, come from a different part of town. But you still could uh, be friends with them, and so uh, you could uh, bond. You could become friends with them. Mm-hmm. So the the animals kind of represent a uh, friendship, mm-hmm. and that's kind of one of the uh, 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 thoughts I had uh, in in writing this book. Yeah. Now you started writing children's books late as a second career. Um, how has it how has it been for you? How, how have you enjoyed it? Oh, I, I um, wholeheartedly have enjoyed it. Yes, I spent, uh, I retired from the Army after serving um, 30 years in uh, in the Army and, and, and 18 months in Iraq. So, I, you know, I came home and, um, you know, still wanted to give back to my community and to, you know, the world as a whole. And, you know, my grandson was slow in reading, so I didn't want him and other kids to be labeled a, a bad kid. So that's why I uh, started writing children books, just to give kids uh, the opportunity to um, to build their confidence. So they're 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 written so the kids could build confidence and be able to read in front of you know their their peers at school. And this has been very rewarding. It really has. Yeah. You know, you mentioned something not too long ago. We had Malcolm Mitchell on the podcast, and Malcolm Mitchell is a a Super Bowl champion, ex NFL player. Uh, he's become a reading advocate, and he shared with me when he arrived at college, he was was in class, and uh, one of his classmates were, was called on to stand up and read a passage. And at that moment, he became terrified because that was a moment he realized he couldn't read, and he, he right. couldn't he couldn't read enough that he could get up and read in front of his college classmates. And uh, he was determined that that he was going to be able to read and teach himself how to read. And the way he did it was with children's books. And I'm, I, I love your story because as a grandmother, you were like, I don't want my grandson to – be left behind. I don't want my grandson to be labeled. I don't want my grandson to think of himself as as less than. And so I'm going to help him. And I think any grandparent or aunt or, or just family member that's out there and is listening to this, if you know uh, a child that is not reading on grade level, you can help out. You can be that person that kind of shares their secret and sits down in quiet and picks up a, a, a children's book 
and reads with him. Or as we've learned, there, there are these high-low books, high interest but low reading ability so that a fifth grader who's reading on a second grade level can confidently read that book and, and build up their skills. So I'm really glad that you pointed that out because I think it's something that we need to remember. We can all serve. We don't need to serve in the military, but boy, oh boy, what a service it is if we can help somebody who finds reading challenging, if we can help that person develop a love of reading. What a beautiful gift that is. Oh, I, I agree. I mean, once um, they once kids learn to read, I mean, you will see their confidence be mm-hmm. so much um, more. And then as they get older, you know, they'll develop to read um, chapter books mm-hmm. and then um, even going to a restaurant, you know, and you could read the menu. And, and, you know, and to me, that just that just builds up on the kids character uh, character as well as their confidence. And that will help them as they grow up to be young adults when they get a job. Whether, uh, whatever they do in life, that reading is the foundation that they need just to, you know, so they would feel good about themselves. And when, you know, when a kid feels good about himself that he can read, uh, you, you will see it. He would be, mm-hmm. he would do better in all the other subjects that, that's taught. Absolutely. Now, speaking of confidence, this, you know, it brings up something. Uh, Vera and I are friends on, on social media and, you know, we've been friends. She's, she was on the podcast a couple of few times, probably back four years ago was her first visit. And so it's been wonderful, um, you know, being friends with her, getting to know her. And this past summer, during a lot of controversy, um, Quaker Oats decided to make a change and they were going to take take away the iconic Aunt Jemima image that they used to market their product for, for many, many years. And um, you came out. Uh, why don't you share your story? You, you, you have a real connection to that story. Yes. Um, Quaker Oat used 12 women to be the um, ambassadors for their company which they these women would go around dressed up as Angie Mama and they would help sell their products. So they would uh, go to fairs and different shows all over the country uh, and help promote um, the uh, Angie Mama pancakes. Mm-hmm. Um, my aunt, my aunt uh, Lillian Richard, who's my great aunt, uh, was one of those ambassadors. And matter of fact, she was the third Angie Mama as a little girl. My dad and my mom and my relatives always taught us, uh, my brothers and my sisters about, uh, Angie Mama, that we, that she was our aunt and that this is what she did for a living. And, you know, as a little kid, you know, you just, you didn't think about it. You just went to the cabinet and, and, you know, fixed pancakes or got some syrup. But then when my dad, when I got old and my, and I truly understood what that meant, I, it just made me prouder. So, um, my, my uh, late twin brother, we, he did research on her and we discovered that, um, she was 21 years old. She was looking for a job. She was in East Texas, a town called Haw- Hawkins, Texas, Texas, uh, which has now been labeled the pancake capital of Texas because of her. <laughs> <laughs> and there were no jobs in Hawkins, Texas. So when, she, uh, at, at the age of 21, she went to Dallas. And um, she was discovered by Quaker Oaks, and they hired her to be their third uh, ambassador um, to sell their products. So she traveled all over the world and uh, would come back. They would bring her back to Hawkins, and she would come back. And then the relatives there, you know, they were, you know, of course, excited to see her. And uh, my mom said every time she would um, come back in town, everyone would go over to her house because she had all of these stories to tell of the places that she went. And my mother would say when when, she, when they walked into her house, you could just smell cakes and cookies because she was a baker herself. And so you could just smell the house with this, this beautiful aroma of baked products. Mm-hmm. Uh, unfortunately, she um, she she took ill in the 60s. And she passed away, so she came back to Hawkins, Texas, and the and the rest of my relatives they took care of her until she um until she eventually you know passed. She's buried in Hawkins, Texas, um, near my mom and dad um, grave site. So whenever I go to visit, um, I always go by her grave site and put um and put some uh, flowers. There is a historical marker that's in the um the city of Hawkins that um talks about her. So. Um, the people in Hawkins and because of Black Lives Matter, 
the people in Hawkins in the state of Texas, as well as all of East Texas, kind of now know her story because uh, um, the family members of the other ambassadors, uh, we um, have been speaking out about our relatives because we didn't want them to know. We wanted the world to know that they were real people. They weren't just some character dressed in black face, that these were real women. We know in the beginning it started out. Some some people did dress like that. But these were real women that um, that wanted to just contribute to society the best way they knew how back in those days mm-hmm. and, and the domestic type of uh, business. But um, they were proud and um, to be able to work and provide for their families. My aunt didn't have any kids. She was married a couple of times and both husbands passed away. And um, but I um, every time I go back home uh, in in Hawkins, I, like I said, I visit my mom and dad. Um, gravesite and I go visit uh my aunt Lillian and uh, I'm proud to to have that Richard lat in my name. <laughs> I used to um um tell people about it and they would kind of look at me like in awe and uh because they didn't know that those are some of those stories that um that they don't have in in uh in history books but it's my uh my hope that eventually maybe not my grandchildren but maybe his children children those um ambassadors that supported and uh, supported the Angel Mama products. I hope that eventually one day their names will be, um, you know, in the history books. Well, I think and I I, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, I think maybe Miss Richards name should be in a children's book written by her great niece. <laughs> well, you know, I have gotten uh, a couple of people have talked to me about that and, uh, I have all of the history about her, so that is one of the things that I'm I'm considering. Yeah, I'm I'm definitely considering. But a lot of people have recommended me uh, that would be a good book, and that that's one way that the young kids that may not know will will know. And as they get older, then they could teach it to their kids. And this and and the story of how Angel Mama you know came about would live on. I, I I was really really happy to see that on your on your social media and I I also was I I love the fact that you started most of your social media posts with uh hey you might not agree with this and uh and 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 that's okay but I love my aunt I'm proud of of her yes yeah because um you know I, I wanted the people know that you know we may not agree. On everything, but we, we you know, we have to learn to be able to still to live together. Mm-hmm. And, uh, friends and some people that may have saw that may have, you know, I didn't want them to have the impression that, you know, that, you know, I was accepting of Angel Mama and the role and, and what it, you know, how some Angel Mamas may have looked like. So mm-hmm. I would always put a disclaimer because, you know, I wanted people to know, get past, uh, the minstrels or what, you know, like back then, get past that because those were real people. That was those 12 women were real live people. Just like, um, uh, uh, just like, um, uh, uh, uncle Ben, those were real live people. Mm -hmm. And, uh, sometimes, you know, we get in, we get so focused on, you know, we want this change. We want this change now. But if you kind of just take a breath and say, wait a minute, let me just research this. Mm -hmm. So, um, and so that's why I would, whenever I got an update on what they were doing, what, um, Quaker Oaks were doing, cause I reached out to them and, you know, unfortunately, you know, they have more money than I have. So they did win and they did change the, um, you know, they took the, um, the image off. Um, mm-hmm. uh, but, um, my, my fight with them, and I don't, I shouldn't say fight, my, uh, quest, my request for them is that they some kind of way still acknowledge, the, um, the, the Angel Mamas, the women that played Angel Mamas. So mm-hmm. I have reached out to them, to them quite a few times, uh, suggesting that, you know, that they, um, still honor them, maybe have their name on the packaging, some on the back or, uh, somewhere at their company, but still acknowledge that those women were instrumental in Quaker Oak being the company that it is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it is, it's a very successful company. Yes. Yeah. So it, it is. My, uh, one of the, um, uh, HBCUs in Hawkins, Texas. I have met with those gentlemen and they are doing an endowment in my aunt's, uh, name. So I'm proud of that. So when that, all of that get worked out, there will be scholarships in my aunt Lillian's name, which has never occurred. And, you know, it, and as a result of, 
everything, the climate in the summer and the Black Lives Movement, that probably would have never had occurred. So I'm really thankful to that. So we're, we're in the process of getting that taken care of. And I hope other um, families will speak up. That's a part of that 12 will speak up and get something in their parent, in their um, relative's name. That's wonderful. Hey, Vera, I know people are going to want to know where they can find out more about MJ and the Big Kitchen Window. So tell everybody where they can find you online, please. Oh, yes, sir. You can um, you can actually go to um, I, my website, which is Happy Reading by Vera. Uh, you could go you could um, you can go to um, uh, Happy Reading by Vera uh, for my website. Or you can also email me at bharris5413 at gmail dot com. Um, you can go on Amazon, uh, Barnes and Noble, and my books are there. Uh, Instagram is B Harris fifty four five four one three. Um, so um, I am on social media, and I'm hoping that um, that anybody, if you're interested in a fun, uh, lo- uh, loving book for kids, toddlers up to probably age twelve, depending on the reading level, I think you will enjoy MJ and the uh, Big Kitchen Window. All right. We've been talking uh, about the pandemic and about friendship and about friends helping each other and about the brand new book from our guest, MJ in the Big Kitchen Window. And it was written by our guest, Vera Harris. Vera, thank you so much for being back on the show. Well, thank you, Jenny. I really appreciate it. And you be safe and stay well. Thank you so much. Please be sure to join us for the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guest will be Lori Walmart. She'll be here to celebrate her brand new book, Code Breaker, Spy Hunter Elizabeth Friedman. That's the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. We want to thank the folks who made today's show so very wonderful. Of course, we want to thank our friend, our guest, Vera Harris. Be sure to check out MJ in the Big Kitchen Window. Also want to thank my team, Alejandro Doherty, Fatima Khan, our amazing interns, Alexia Braun and Hannah Pat Oboiski. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. I want to thank Augie the Doggy for having my back here in the studio. But most of all, we want to thank you. You are your child's most important teacher. That's absolutely true. And you know, you're making the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast.